At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchdown phone. Also, today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Jennifer Blacker. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Thank you, Ashley. Good afternoon, and thank you for participating in today's call. My name is Jennifer Blacker, and I'm with the Office of Health Communication and Education at FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. The purpose of this call is to discuss FDA's recently published proposed rule deeming products to be subject to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Earlier today, FDA's news release on this announcement posted to its website and was distributed to news media. Today, I am joined by Mr. Mitch Zeller, Director of FDA's Center for Tobacco Products, and Ms. Jerry Voss, Senior Regulatory Counsel in the Office of Regulations at FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. Mr. Zeller will provide an overview of today's action, and Ms. Voss will go over the proposed rule in more detail and highlight areas in which FDA is seeking public comment. A question and answer period will follow. Participants will be in a listen-only mode until we open up the call for questions. Also, please note that this call is a public call and open to anyone who has dialed in. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Zeller. Thanks, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to speak with you about the historic action that FDA is taking today by issuing this proposed rule, commonly referred to as deeming, that would extend the agency's tobacco product authorities to cover additional products that meet the legal definition of a tobacco product. Currently, FDA regulates cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, roll-your-own tobacco, and smokeless tobacco. However, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act gave FDA the authority to deem other products to be subject to FDA's authority. And under today's proposed rule, products that would be deemed to be subject to our authority would include electronic cigarettes, cigars, pipe tobacco, certain dissolvables that are not smokeless tobacco, nicotine gels, and water pipe tobacco. Products made or derived from tobacco that are marketed for therapeutic purposes will continue to be regulated as medical products under the agency's existing drug and device authorities in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Today's action comes on the heels of the 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. The report states that while great progress has been made since 1964, the annual death toll from smoking attributable disease has risen to 480,000. History has shown the dangers of an unregulated tobacco marketplace where unsubstantiated and misleading health claims, such as for purported light and low tar products, caused immense damage to public health. At today's rate of tobacco use, there will be 17 million avoidable deaths between now and mid-century. Deeming is imperative to establish a comprehensive regulatory framework for tobacco products that will help decrease the death toll and move future generations closer to being tobacco-free. The tobacco landscape is evolving at a dizzying pace. Products that didn't exist a decade ago are now being used by youth and adults alike. Between 2000 and 2011, the use of non-cigarette combustible products increased by 123%. And between 2011 and 2012, e-cigarettes doubled in popularity among middle school and high school age students. A deeming final rule will help FDA keep pace with this rapidly evolving landscape. Deeming differs from most public health regulations in that it is an enabling regulation. It will allow us to propose future regulatory action on these and yet to be conceived tobacco products in order to carry out our mission of protecting the public health. Expanding our regulatory authority over tobacco products gives FDA additional tools to reduce the number of illnesses and premature deaths associated with their use. Important existing requirements and restrictions, such as ingredient reporting, age restrictions to prevent sales to underage youth, the prohibition of false and misleading claims and unauthorized claims of reduced exposure and risk, and the prohibition of vending machine sales and free samples will be extended to include all of the newly deemed products. Deeming would place FDA in a vital gatekeeping role for all tobacco products. A deeming final rule would mark the first time that manufacturers of currently unregulated tobacco products would have to provide information about their ingredients and harmful constituents. It would also mark the first time that the companies that make these categories of tobacco products 
would have to subject their products to review by FDA in order to keep them on the market or introduce them as new products for sale. My colleague Jerry Voss will provide additional details regarding the pre-market review of new tobacco products. But to wrap up, bringing these additional tobacco products under FDA's regulatory authority will enable the agency to develop a comprehensive nicotine regulatory framework, taking into account the diversity of the nicotine-containing products in the marketplace. Science-based product regulation is one of the most powerful forms of consumer protection, and today's action signals the start of a new era in preventing tobacco-related disease and death. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. At this time, we will now hear from Ms. Bob. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, and thank you to everyone for participating in today's call. As Mitch stated, the deeming proposed rule proposes regulating additional products that meet the definition of a tobacco product under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This includes the tobacco product categories previously mentioned, e-cigarettes, cigars, pipe tobacco, certain dissolvables, nicotine gels, and water pipe tobacco. When the proposed rule is finalized, FDA will be able to use powerful regulatory tools to help reduce tobacco-related disease and death. For example, the provisions in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act would automatically apply to newly deemed tobacco products, including requirements to register and submit product and ingredient listings, People. A, a prohibition on new tobacco product marketing without FDA review, a prohibition of direct and implied claims of reduced risk without FDA review and authorization based on scientific evidence, and a prohibition of free samples. As mentioned previously, new tobacco, new tobacco products are required to undergo FDA pre-market review. We recognize that it may be a challenge for manufacturers of many newly deemed tobacco products, including some e-cigarette manufacturers, to identify valid predicates to use the substantial equivalence pathway. For this reason, FDA is proposing that these manufacturers submit applications for pre-market review of tobacco products, or PMTAs, to FDA no later than 24 months following the effective date of the final rule, during which time FDA would not intend to initiate an enforcement action for failing to have a marketing authorization. In addition, as long as the manufacturer has submitted a PMTA within 24 months, FDA would not intend to initiate such an enforcement action against the product on the market while the application is pending with the agency. So as a practical effect of these compliance periods, we would expect that most firms would continue marketing their tobacco products pending FDA's review of their marketing applications. In addition, when finalized, the rule would apply the following new requirements to newly deemed tobacco products. First, minimum age and identification restrictions to prevent the sales to underage youth. Second, requirements to include health warning labels. And finally, a prohibition of vending machine sales except in, air, in facilities that never admit youth. The deeming proposed rule does not include a ban on online sales or television advertising of these cigarettes. However, once a tobacco product is deemed, the law's general prohibition on false and misleading promotion will apply, as well as the prohibition on unauthorized use of modified risk claims. In addition, FDA may put in place restrictions on the sale and distribution of those products, including further specific advertising and promotion restrictions. These restrictions would require separate rulemaking and public comment. FDA is also not proposing to categorically ban flavors of newly deemed products. In order to do this, FDA must issue, through the rulemaking process, a tobacco product standard under Section 907 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. FDA is currently assessing available research regarding the impact of flavors on tobacco, bro tobacco product use and is funding research on this issue. In addition, FDA is proposing different compliance dates for various provisions so that all regulated entities, including small businesses, will have adequate time to comply with the requirements of a final deeming rule. And as its name implies, the deeming proposed rule is just that, a proposed rule. 
FDA is seeking public comment on the rule generally and specifically in the following areas. For example, FDA recognizes that different tobacco products may have the potential for different public health impacts. Therefore, we are seeking comments, research, and data on the proposed regulations to determine if there are any circumstances in which different regulatory approaches would be appropriate for different tobacco products. In addition, FDA recognizes that different tobacco products may have the potential for varying effects on public health and is therefore proposing two options for the categories of cigars that would be covered by this rule. We are specifically seeking comments on whether all cigars should be, should be subject to deeming and which other provisions of the proposed rule may be appropriate or not appropriate for different kinds of cigars. Thus, we are proposing two options for the categories of cigars that would be covered by this rule. Option one proposes to regulate all products that meet the definition of a tobacco product. Option two proposes defining a category of premium cigars that would not be subject to FDA's regulatory authority. In the proposed rule, and as stated in option two, we propose to, to define premium cigars as tobacco products that are wrapped in whole tobacco leaf made by manually combining the wrapper, filler, and binder, have no filler, tip, or non-tobacco mouthpiece, have a certain price point per cigar, and may be used differently by consumers than other types of tobacco products. We are seeking answers to the many public health questions posed by products, such as these cigarettes, that do not involve the burning of tobacco and inhalation of its smoke, as the agency develops an appropriate level of regulatory oversight for these products. As a result, we are seeking comment in this proposed rule as to how such products should be regulated. Further, comments and parts of newly deemed tobacco products, I'm sorry, components and parts of newly deemed tobacco products would be included in the scope of this proposed rule. We are seeking comment on whether FDA should define components and parts of these newly deemed tobacco products and how those items might be distinguished from accessories of tobacco products. The proposed rule does not include accessories of newly deemed tobacco products, such as, for example, cigar cutters and hookah cases. I will now turn the call back over to Mitch to provide some closing remarks. Thanks, Jerry. A couple of final thoughts. Understandably, a historic and comprehensive proposed rule such as today's comes with a large amount of information and areas for public comment. So to assist the public in accessing this information, we've created a new deeming webpage entitled Extending Authorities to Additional Tobacco Products. The proposed rule will be available for comment starting tomorrow and will be open for a period of 75 days. And as is the case with all our proposed regulations, we encourage comment and will consider all comments, data, research, and other information submitted to the docket. In conclusion, when finalized, the rule will represent a significant first step in the agency's ability to effectively regulate tobacco products. The FDA will play a vital role in protecting the public by reviewing all new products and health-related claims for tobacco products in today's rapidly evolving marketplace. And as we learn more about these products, the agency will have additional opportunities over the long term to make a positive difference in the public health burden of tobacco use in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. and Jerry. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up so that we can get to as many questions as possible. Operator will take the first question. Your first question comes from Gregory Conley. Your line is open. Hi, Dr. Zeller. Uh, Gregory Conley from the Heartland Institute. I'm about 200 pages through the deeming regulation, and there's some discussion of non-nicotine products, but there's really no indication of how the FDA plans to deal with uh, component parts that from one manufacturer or one distributor can be intended for use with a nicotine product uh, versus another distributor with the same exact product that is going to be marketing that uh, for non-nicotine usage. And then also, uh, if the FDA plans to do anything regarding non-nicotine e-cigarette liquid. Um, it's a good and complicated question. 
and I would encourage you to, to point out those scenarios and the and what you see as the as the implications for what the regulatory status of the finished product should be based upon a description of the potential scenarios but all roads lead back to the statutory definition of a tobacco product and ultimately there has to be something there that is made or derived from tobacco there can be an a component that has no tobacco in it has no nicotine in it but if it winds up becoming a part of a finished product that otherwise meets the definition of a covered tobacco product then it's a then it's a component and subject to regulation as a covered product. This is an awfully complicated area, especially when it comes down to the, literally the moving parts with e-cigarettes. And we would encourage you to call all of that out in any written submission. But just to be clear, two or three times when they point out those moving parts, they say uh, it's in the finished product or intended or expected to be used in a tobacco product. And there's a lot of questions right now over what that means. And I'd really like to hear from you what you think that means. I can't go beyond the words of what we had in the preamble. Um, we, if it's intended or expected to be used in a finished product that meets the definition of a tobacco product, then it's a covered tobacco product subject to the agency's regulatory reach if this rule goes final as proposed. This is your opportunity to respond to how you think we should interpret the statutory definition and, and, and give us advice and guidance and suggestions for what should and should not be included. The one thing we can't get away from is the statutory definition. Ultimately, it has to be something that's made or derived from tobacco. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one and please record your name clearly when prompted. One moment, please, for your first que next question. Your next question comes from Kip Talley. Please state your organization. Hi, thank you. This is uh, Kip Talley with the International Premium Cigar and Pipe Retailers Association. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Zeller, for taking the time today to answer some questions. Um, a quick two-part question. Would you provide some insight into how CTP worked to develop a premium definition uh, for cigars? And specifically, uh, how did CTP come up with the Ten dollar price point number as outlined in uh, number six. The, the 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 key word here is proposed. This is a proposed definition under what we're calling option two in the rule, um, and we welcome any and all comments on the elements that will make up our proposed definition, including suggestions for modifications, additions, subtractions. Specifically to your point about um, the the ten dollar price point. We surveyed the marketplace, and um, and we saw that um, there were a, an awful number of, of 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 products that, along with these other characteristics, other elements of the definition that we're proposing to define what a premium cigar is, um, would meet an appropriate definition for premium cigars. We also make it clear in the preamble that we have a public health concern that we don't inadvertently include in the definition. Were we to go with option two in a final rule, cigars that don't belong in the definition of premium cigars that would otherwise be exempted from regulation. So we welcome any and all comments on any part of the definition that we have proposed. Thank you, sir. We'll take the next caller. Jordan Thornton, please state your organization. Uh, yes, hello, I'm a member of the Cigar Rights of America. Okay. Yeah, we're there. Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear us? We're ready for uh, your question. Yes. So under the uh, proposed, uh, under the proposal, I understand that there are two options. Uh, would you be amenable to third options or other options that were, um, I guess, elicited from 
uh, the responses that, that you'll garner as a, as a result of this proposal. The comment period is your opportunity to make suggestions on things that were proposed and things that weren't proposed. If, if you have alternatives that you want us to consider, um, it, is, it is your right to, to, uh, to make those kinds of suggestions and to submit evidence in support of alternatives beyond options one or options two. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from Azim Chowhury, Space Nature Organization. Hi, this is Azim from Keller and Heckman. My question is related to the comment period. The 75 days seems awfully short for a very complicated proposed rule, uh, one that took the FDA nearly four years to put out. Can we hope or expect the comment period to be extended, for example, the same way that the advance notice for menthol was extended? I can't prejudge the issue of extensions of the comment period. We, we can only consider that in response to a request. I'd like to hereby request the comment period be extended. You'll probably need to put that in writing, sir. I will do that. Thank you. Your next question comes from Bob Bridges. Please state your organization. Uh, Westside Vapors. Um, it's just a question to the panel uh, for clarity. Uh, would e-cigarettes with nicotine from vegetables be classified as tobacco? cigarettes? It needs to be made or derived from tobacco. That is the statutory definition. Thank you. Your next question comes from Vago Galunas. Please state your organization. Okay, I'm just a supporter of the cigars in general. just want to say I really appreciate you allowing there be a public comment period. Thank you. I'll take the next question. Kevin King, please state your organization. Kevin King, your line is open. Please state your organization. I'm sorry, the question I was going to ask was asked by a previous caller. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. One moment, please, for your next question. Your next question comes from Lou Ritter. Please state your organization. Uh, hi, yes, uh, Mr. Zoller. This is Lou Ritter, president of the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association, or AIMSA. I'd like to ask you to please elaborate on the product registration requirements relative to the liquids used in uh, electronic cigarettes and the various uh, strengths and w how many different registrations would be required for a manufacturer? The, um, the registration and listing requirements in Section 905 of the Tobacco Control Act uh, would be what would um, cover your organization and um, the types of products that you're talking about. Um, you would need to consult that um, to, to get some more information. Also, in the unified agenda, we expressed our intent to draft a regulation regarding registration and listing, so you can uh, keep an eye out for that, which will also have additional information. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Dana Smith. Please state your organization. Dating Media. And do you have a question? I do. Thank you. Thank you for taking questions today. My question refers to the grandfathered in type of clause that's on there of uh, 2007 and before. Um, I'm curious if you could give us a little insight on how you came up with the date of 2007 since there has been, as you know, um, an explosion in the market, as you had said, and, and it has advanced technologically considerably since then. And I was wondering how the uh, panel came up with 2007. Well, actually, it wasn't FDA that came up with the data. It was the United States Congress, um, and they wrote it into the law. And so what we state in the preamble is that legally, as a, a matter of regulatory policy, that's the date that we have to use. But we welcome comment 
on our interpretation of the statute. Thank you. Your next question. Your next question comes from Joseph Fuse. Please state your organization. Yeah, vapor tobacco manufacturing. And your question? question? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, listen, I, I appreciate the call very much today. Uh, one of the areas highlighted, uh, as I read the, the regulation for, for potential future regulation, subject to comment, is, is flavor. Uh, I didn't see, uh, with respect to cigarettes, I didn't see any discussion of nicotine strengths. Uh, can, 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 can one take from that that that's not currently an area of concern for uh, CTP? The deeming proposed rule is, is, is as, as we've described, a, a foundational step to, to, to lay the groundwork for uh, potential future regulation, in, including conceivably a product standard for flavors. You, you shouldn't read um, the, 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 the absence of any discussion of that particular issue one way or the other. This is one step at a time. Thank you, Director. We'll take the next question. Your next question comes from Richard Henning. Please state your organization. My organization is Nick Vape. My question has been answered. I withdraw my question. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. I think we have time for one more question. Your next question comes from Victoria. Please state your organization. Victoria, please check your mute button. We're unable to hear you. Thank you for that tip. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with that magic 2007 date. Is there the potential that the FDA would outline a baseline product for substantial equivalency or a different date, um, say the date of the deeming regulation? Um, because again, technology has changed drastically and electronic cigarettes were not readily available prior to that date. A couple of points. Um, uh, first, the date was established by Congress and put into the law, and, and, and it's our interpretation of the statute that that's the date that, um, that we have to deal with, but we ask for comment on that interpretation. But there's also an extensive discussion in the preamble um, that hopefully will signal that we are very aware of the implications that the February 15, 2007 date might have for any of the newly deemed products that may find it challenging to find a valid predicate to be able to pursue the substantial equivalence pathway. And that's why we have proposed a compliance policy that Jerry outlined uh, in, our, in our presentation, and we welcome comment on any and all aspects of the compliance policy that we've laid out there. Thank you. Okay, it looks like there are a few more questions, so we will keep going. Your next question comes from Link Williams. Please state your organization. Hey, this is Link Williams with uh, AIMSA, uh, American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association. Um, Mitch, you've got a lot of uh, small businesses on the line here listening, and uh, a lot of them are concerned with what the user fees are going to look like. Can you elaborate where they can look up and find what the current tobacco user fees are so they can get a, an understanding of that? The current tobacco user fees are handled, and we're in a transitional period right now, under a statute currently administered by the United States Department of Agriculture. We are in the middle of a completely separate rulemaking because by law, FDA, by the end of the current fiscal year, September 30th of this year, has to take over the responsibility for the assessment and then the collection of user fees. So look for a final rule that will be coming out that uh, re reflects our uh, consideration of the comments that were uh, received on the proposed user fee rule as the next step in that process. 
so the, the history of uh, tobacco to date with product registrations and substantial equivalents, is there an understanding of what the fees have been submitted with those? User fees doesn't work that way. It's um, for drugs and, 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 and some of the other FDA regulated products, there is a user fee that accompanies the submission. That's not the way the tobacco product user fees work. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Your next question comes from Greg Zimmerman. Please state your organization. IPCPR, International Cream Pipe or Cigar and Pipe Retail Association. And my question, uh, Mr. Zella, what would the process look like at the end of the 75-day comment period? When the comment period closes, we begin the, the process, uh, which is an internal one, of synthesizing and analyzing every single comment that has been submitted. We take that responsibility very, very seriously. And comments that have been submitted with supporting information, uh, information that um, is, is, is new to us, uh, gets a very careful read because our job legally under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and the Administrative Procedure Act is to carefully consider all the comments that have come in as we look back at what we had proposed and then determine what we think should be in both the preamble and what we call the codified language, the actual language of the regulations that would be enforceable, that would be the major parts of a final rule. So um, at a very high level, that's, uh, that's the process, uh, and that process commences when the comment period closes. And does that, the process then be, uh, go back to OMB for for final approval? Yes. Thank you. Your next question comes from Daniel Walsh. Please state your organization. Daniel Walsh, Pure Backo USA. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you so much for all that you guys are doing. I had the chance to meet you in uh, Las Vegas at the NATO show and, and really support the effort for reasonable regulation. That being said, I am interested in the PMTA process. It's our understanding that under Section 907-21 USC 387-G3J, uh, the new electronic cigarette products, although they don't have a predicate, they also don't meet the compliance standards for existing tobacco product standards. Will there be a path for these new electronic cigarettes, e-liquids, and vaporization products to get PMTA approval? I'm not familiar with the specific statutory provision that you're referring to. If, if, if you have a reaction, a concern, a suggestion for something that you see either in the preamble of the proposed rule or the codified language that you think we should consider and change, make sure you put that into written comments. Um, so for clarification, is it your belief that these new e-liquid e-cigarette products will be viable for PMTA approval? Hi, this is Beverly Chernick. I think that I think I understand what you're talking about in the statute where it talks about what's required to be shown um, in a pre-market tobacco application. One of the things is that you are in compliance with any um, product standards. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, the, the fourth criteria of the PMTA submission is that it meet existing tobacco product standards. There are no tobacco product standards right now. A tobacco product standard is the standard that we set by regulation, um, and we have not done any of those yet. So you, don't, you wouldn't even have to worry about that. Thank you. Your last question comes from Will Woodley. Please. State your organization. Hi, I'm with Clientel Kaplan and Becker. Thank you for taking the question. Mr. Zeller, can you provide some background on the agency's apparent decision to leave in place the uh, limited sampling exception for smokeless but uh, banned sampling for all newly deemed products? Thank you. Um, as you know, the, um, the, the federal regulations have a ban on um, uh, free samples of cigarettes and that there is the um, limited exception for the um, for smokeless tobacco. 
we are proposing right now, we believe it is in the best interest uh, and most appropriate to not have any exceptions for free samples. However, we do ask for comment as to whether or not folks believe that this free sample prohibition without any exceptions is appropriate and um, does appropriately protect the public. And just as a follow-up, just to make sure I understand correctly, the, the proposal, though, is to leave in place the limited exception for sampling of smokeless tobacco products. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. That will not change. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Zeller and Ms. Voss for providing today's information. A replay will be available in about an hour um, until May 8th. If you have questions after today's call, you can direct them to Grayson Fowler at the Center for Tobacco Products. He is available at G-R-A-Y-S-O-N dot S-O-W-L-E-R at S-D-A dot H-H-S dot gov or by phone at 301-796-4270. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's teleconference. Thank you for participating in today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you.